So for me, those were my just a few opening remarks, uh, program director. Uh, and I will hand it back to you to take the program forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mpanga. Our sponsor for this evening is the CEO and founder of Nest Life Assurance Corporation, Mr. Vusi Sitole. Join me as I welcome Mr. Sitole to say a few words. Uh, program director, Dr. Um, Kwanazi at large, Honorable Dr. Ruel Koza, leaders and members of the BMF, ladies and gentlemen, a good evening to you all. When the immediate past president of the BMF, Tunzin Nal, approached me, approached me uh, five years ago, in fact, he approached Neslav, not me personally. Uh, to work with the BMF annually in the form of this memorial lecture in memory and in upholding the legacy of Don Mkonazi, Nest Life warmly embraced the BMF approach. <clears throat> Nest Life indeed has walked this journey with the BMF over the last five years. I do commend the BMF for having ensured that each year the memorial lecture and this year, uh, the memorial lecture is actually delivered by ex distinguished members of our society. In the memorial lecture this year, we have yet another special guest in Dr. Ruel Koza, a stalwart of the BMF and who knew Undonga well. In the recent past, the lecture was delivered by another great figure of our society. In the, in the form of a good friend of mine, Judge Buga Shabalala. This evening though, is about Undonga. As one of the groundbreaking leaders of the BMF, Don Mkona has trailed the place of change within the business arena. This earned him the accolades to be regarded as the champion of BNBE, godfather of black business, and a pioneer of transformation to alter power relations of the South African economic scheme of things. Sadly though, 25 years down our, our democracy, the economic system is still not transformed. Black people still have the knee on their neck, but hey, we're still breathing. It is on this vein that I challenge the BMF to move from the corner of protestation when a white male is appointed in a senior C COE position and start serious activism to transform the economic system. But in mind, the knee is pressing hard on us. The voice of protest only will not bring the change. Let's learn from the spirit of the likes of Don Mkwanazi. Action is needed. Undonga is a man who, whose mission left us a code by which to crack the hardest of nuts of resistance until the light come shining through on the vulnerability of proven competent leadership that paved the way for some of the people that are in leadership today. This is the one and only beloved Don Mkwalazi to us all and for whom we once more have convened to celebrate his spirited feats through this memorial lecture. BMF, I thank you for remembering Don Mkwanazi Undonga. Dr. Ruel Koza, thank you for gracing this occasion. You knew Ndonga well, and I'm sure you'll pray tribute to him befittingly. Thank you for making time to grace this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you and I wish you a successful memorial lecture, Kandonga. I thank you. Thank you, sir, for those very comforting words. An organization of this nature would not be possible without the one who leads the ship to safety. I now welcome our BMF president, Mr. Andile Namlala, representing the National Office of the BMF and the BMF as a whole to share his thoughts at this prestigious event 
in memory of our past president, Dr. Don Mpanazi. Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Vino. And uh, let me first start by uh, greeting uh, the BMF standards that are amongst us tonight. Let me extend my uh, greeting to Dr. Ruel Koza and echo the sentiments that have been shared that uh, uh, we are very grateful that he has agreed to deliver this lecture tonight. I must extend my sincere gratitude also to Babu Jobe. And I want to sincerely apologize, Babu Jobe, for not being able to connect with you before this lecture. And we are very grateful that you continue to support us. And I will extend myself into meeting up with you shortly after this lecture. Uh, thanks for coming through and thanks for being with us as a partner in this journey. And I know even yourself as a black business leader, you're quite vested in seeing us succeed. And I must also greet uh, Siswe and I have been interacting with Siswe and the family. Thanks, Siswe, for allowing us to have your father as our beacon of hope during these trying times. Actually, my input would be just limited, particularly to that. Uh, when Babu Don Kwanazi, uh, during their time, uh, they had realized that the ground was actually moving and they couldn't just be held bent on talking the politics of managerial leadership when actually the country itself was in a, a was burning. I think the BMF leadership of our days, and I remember, by the way, uh, since I think I've shared this conversation with you before, the last time uh, Babundonga came to the BMF gathering at the Caesars Palace, I actually had the privilege of walking him to the car. And the message that he said to me, and I remember it very vividly even till to date, at that time, there was no likelihood that I would be a BMF president or anything. But he said, see, share Kuni Bafana, the BMF. He did uh, pass those, those words. <clears throat> I'm reminded now, uh, Siswa and, and the colleagues in, out there in the country that we are faced with a situation that is probably even worse than the 1985 uh, uh, crises. Of, uh, the, the, the of the era of the, the emergency, national emergency period, where the, the streets and the country was burning. We are faced with a, a, a colossal, a very dangerous uh, pandemic that is killing and destroying, not just only the human flesh, but is also destroying and killing our economy as a whole. And I, I take heed into the Babu Jobe's advice when he says, I think BMF and its other formations, and I, I, the same as Pilani had said that, I think this is the time that we cannot only be reduced to uh, protest, protest uh, 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 campaigning. It, this is the time that we cannot just only be relegated into a, a, a position of just crying foul, at the periphery via the, the appointment okay. and, and many other issues. This is the time that we must emulate or emulate our forebears by actually taking a stand and deciding what is and what should be the future of our country. As I speak to you now, BMF, uh, under its leadership and, 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 and operational team in the research unit, are putting together a document that would be redefined uh, as the document of a, a new economic codessa that we need to have. And that team is actually have seen the other two documents that were presented by both the ruling party and the business for South Africa. And we want to say it very clear and categorically that those uh, rehashed and almost the same type of arguments that are raised in those documents are not the things that we want to adopt and are things that we reject with the contempt it deserves. I think the new economic paradigm that we need to define as the BMF going into the future 
is the one that is unorthodox, is the one that is chanting an unterritory, uh, is chanting path in, in territories that have never been walked before. It's a document that we need to make sure that it speaks to the hearts of South Africans. It can define a clear picture of what needs to be done going forward. Uh, and as a result, we are saying that as a BMF, we need to deal with the issue of uh, uh, the corruption that is taking place, the issue of misaligned economic interventions that are being put into uh, helping our situation. And as a result, we are very firm and clear that very soon we will release our own discussion document in that regard, and we will lobby and rally the government of the day to make sure that they adopt many of those inputs that the BMF leadership and its membership are putting out in, out there for, for engagements. With those few words, I want to say that uh, we are very worried as an organization by the level of corruption that is prevailing in our country. We're very worried about the level of impunity of that corruption where people that are meant to have lead our country to stop the bleeding and people that have are meant to lead our country out of the state capture quagmire are actually the ones that are in the forefront and are actually the ones the new dawn picture that we had been promised it seems to us that is also manifested with agents of corruption it seems to us that it's a it's a new dawn of the the it's now our time for us to eat it seems to us it's a new dawn of those that it's, it's, we have also arrived. We must loot as much as we can. It's quite worrying that during the COVID crisis, when there is an evident picture of life-threatening epidemic, and that is both destroying the economy and the human flesh of our South African uh, citizens, people find it as an opportunity to make a get-rich-quick scheme. We have the likes of Babu Vusistole, the likes of Babu Ruel, and many other entrepreneurs who have over their lifetime built businesses, formidable businesses that could withstand the test of time. I don't know what is it amongst our generation, particularly us, that seems to believe that you can be able to just make millions of friends overnight. I don't know what is it with us this generation that seems to believe that you can just be on a get rich quick scheme where you climb without any effort, without spending any sweat, without having any track record. The businesses that are given opportunities in the tender system are businesses that are fly by nights that were opened in the last couple of months precisely to be aligned and apportioned to get these opportunities. And as we participate in the BBC, we don't participate to promote, when we speak about black business, to, to promote migrants and people that are not necessarily uh, 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 businesses or, or experienced business people who can just come in and overnight build businesses. So we are worried, and we will make that call as well very clear, very soon. We say that in the spirit of Babu Don Kwanas, the champions of, of the future that now we are banning, the champions of the prosperity that now we are extinguishing, we are saying to them that we are forever grateful for them chanting the path and creating organizations like the BMF, that we can be able to have the platforms to engage robustly, still take advice, still take heed in the counseling of our elders on what needs to be done going forward. With those few words, I wish that, uh, and I want to say to the family that we are forever indebted to you as the family and as the BMF family, we are forever grateful to the fact that your father, your son, your husband, your grandfather was able at some point in time to be able to have a telling contribution to the progress of our country. BMF is a notable figure today because of their work. BMF is an organization that is building on step-by-step -step on a cathedral uh, type of leadership where we extend ourselves and we build and we add a stone or two
to the cathedral that many others after us would come and emulate. That's why we got its uh, reputation and its interest very guardedly. It's because we know that we inherited a, a, a jewel from them uh, and a jewel that we cannot afford to diminish as we have seen with many other black organizations, including the ruling party, where people don't respect the foundations and the structures that were built for them to survive, where people don't take a responsibility for the work that they need to do to make sure that South Africans as a whole have a platform to live, have a platform to thrive. We are now mired by a complete corrupt uh, state system where even in the office, office of the presidents, you'll find culprits, you'll find names of people that are mired into a corruption scandal. And we are saying enough is enough as the BMF. We have to make a call that as South Africans, we must define a new path that could deliver us this prosperity that Babu Don and others had promised us. With those few words, I'd like to say thank you, Vini, for your time and thanks for the opportunity. Cheers. Thank you, Andile. Um, I think we have a video that will play now. There are a number of uh, water shed moments. But I think for me, the most important one was that the liberation movements and the political organization accorded the BMF the respect, recognized that the BMF was a legitimate player, a genuine player with bona fides. Uh, uh, the ANC, the government in waiting, could not move on major policy fronts without consulting with the PMF. The recognition and the respect accorded to the PMF, for me, that was the highlight. PMF during our tenure became a national organization, not a Johannesburg organization, not a Devon organization, not a P organization. And uh, of course, we started student chapters and redefined who could be a member of the Black Management Forum. We said, Anyone who has a manager can become a member of the BMF. Anyone with the potential to become a manager could become a member. That's where the student chapters came along. Also, those who aspire. So we're not a closed book. We're an open book and cast the net wider. That's why people like Jimmy Mang came through into the PMF fold, who, as we all know, became president. So we're proud that we identify young talent that could play a role into the future. The PMF possesses intellectual capital that is so needed in this country. The PMF needs to partner with the state or with the government in a constructive, critical manner. Political emancipation plus economic freedom equals total liberation. The PMF should not be orthodox. It should in fact become a little bit outrageous and unorthodox to define things in a new direction. It must challenge uh, the status quo. Everything you do must be based on your ideology, in the best interest of this country, and it must lead us 
to the critical mass of managers. But a manager that is a member of the BMF must be a new breed of a manager. His or her DNA must be different from all these other managers we know, driven by the values, by the ideology. There must be a, a code of order for this new breed of a manager who understands where she or he is coming from. Not just a manager who is there to manage, make profit. No, the responsibility of a new breed of a manager that calls herself or himself a member of the PMF must be different, must look beyond just the profit motive. A better South Africa. A South Africa which is my country, which is our country, which is our future. A truly amazing and brilliant stalwart, Dr. Don Mkwanazi, who has paved the way for a better South Africa for most of us. At this juncture, I'd like to welcome and acknowledge our Deputy President of BMF, Ms. Tasneem Federicks, and all other participants to this fifth annual Don Mkwanazi Memorial Lecture. The video will play again because our guest speaker is having difficulties to log on. So while the video plays, I'm sure we will have him on. Okay, thanks, Vino. I, I think just before the, the video continues, I, I, we must extend our apology. The guest speaker was just online now. I think something happened to, to his connection. Uh, he will join us uh, shortly. But just in the meantime, let's, let's also use this opportunity to also mention that uh, as the BMF, we adopted uh, uh, and we created a structure called uh, a litigation fund, a George Nangwata litigation fund. And I think uh, that structure is quite one of the important tools uh, in line with what Uba Mustuale was, uh, was advising us, that it's one of the important tools to make things and to shift things and make them to be practical in our interventions. I think uh, Babu Mkwanaz in his uh, video just now did advise that BMF cannot be an organization that is not willing to, to chant and, and, and chatter territories. It's not an organization that must be orthodox. We therefore make a call and a plea again to our members and the general membership and, and supporters of BMF and South Africans who are watching this video tonight to say that our litigation uh, fund is, we, we still need uh, firm support from the public because there are many issues we have seen, uh, by the way, and we have advised at a distance some of the challenges that were, were, were put forward against the transformation imperatives of our country. When, uh, for instance, the Minister of Tourism and the Minister of Small Businesses had adopted uh, a policy to say that all their interventions for the COVID-19 would be considered under the BE uh, parameters. And we thank them for that bold steps. And we thank the courts for the interpretation and the pronouncement they have made about the imperative of uh, the imperatives of the BE legislation. We were participating yesterday, only yesterday, from the BE Commission uh, webinar, where the level of transformation in the last year or so is starting again to regress. We are saying that that litigation fund and many other initiatives that we get involved in must be used as the way to make sure that we keep up the pressure. We actually get a court pronouncement so that the legal statutes of our country can define and be more clear and vivid of what needs to be done to achieve that uh, transformation. So we make that call even tonight to say that the transformation agenda is far much more in trouble and is under threat because amongst other things, unfortunately, other fellow black business people 
are using the opportunity of transformation for their own ends, where they do fraudulent work and they participate in nefarious uh, uh, business dealings that doesn't give a good name for black business people. We are saying to them they must desist, desist from doing that. We are saying to them that their efforts of being corrupt are undermining not just only themselves, they are undermining a noble cause and a clear agenda for black advancement in our country. We call upon our own professionals and managers who we can firmly say that they are not the uh, epitome of the black excellence that we represent, that they must not participate uh, and abate and be conduits into corrupt activities via their work in government offices and any other places in our country where corruption manifests itself. So all those, uh, you know, we're making it uh, tonight because we're using the opportunity now that uh, our guest speaker is still not connected to make those pronouncements and make sure that BMF's agenda and BMF's noble agenda of an inclusive society and an inclusive economy and equitable distribution of our wealth is not undermined by the very same people that seems to look like us and is not undermined by the same people that sings the same songs as us. We are calling upon all black professionals and self-loving South Africans to not participate in corrupt activities, colleagues. It's actually quite dire now. The situation and the picture that our country is in and the level of corruption that has taken place during the COVID era and many, many years before that is actually collapsing our economy. We are calling upon all, all of us, those that actually even benefit from the corrupt activities and those that cheers on the people that show some sort of glimpse of success under the disguise of corrupt benefits and corrupt uh, gains. We are saying, to all of us who are directly and indirectly abating and participating in the corrupt activities, we must desist from doing so. South Africa deserves better. We need to build a nation where each and every one of us has an opportunity to succeed, where each and every one of us is living in a country where the basic needs and the basic necessities are being able to afford it to them for that so that their well-being and their children's well-being and health and education opportunities are not limited only to us. The COVID crisis and the inequalities that it had shown, it has made us to be forced to realize that corruption and ineptitude and inefficiencies in our governing systems are actually detrimental to our own well-beings going forward. So Vino, with those few words, I don't know if you have managed to get the, our speaker back, and if not, then I, su I suggest that we can play one of the other videos, not necessarily the one that you just made. What better platform to share this agenda of corruption? Um, you know, we all are responsible in some way to being the best citizens of South Africa because corruption just robs the innocent of their own livelihoods, right? So I think um, the moment we've all been waiting for Allow me to read the profile of our keynote speaker. He is a distinguished thought leader, businessman, president of the Institute of Directors in South Africa, public speaker and change agent at the forefront of transformation in the South African political economy. Dr. Kosa is currently chairman of Zana, Zana Investments the Public Investment Corporation, and Asopol Insurance Group, amongst others. He has chaired the numerous boards of such corporations as Eskom, Nedbank, and many more. Dr. Corsa is quite an academic. His qualifications include, among others, a BA Honours in Psychology. He is also a professor extraordinaire of the University of Stellenbosch Business School and currently the visiting professor at Rhodes Business School, the University of Free State Business School, and the Witz Business School, as well as Chancellor of the University of Limpopo. He is an author of numerous books, including Let Africa Lead, 
the power of governance and others. Corsa is also, he also farms, packs and exports avocado pears, as well as writes lyrics and produces music as a labor of love. Dr. Corsa has lately become something of a patriarch in his family, a position he says comes with huge positives. He takes kingship seriously. Outside of business and academia, Dr. Corsa has an abiding interest in the people and for this reason is fluent in several languages. Dr. Corsa has also dedicated time to writing lyrics for compositions. He, together with a colleague, has to date orchestered and recorded of 60 of his cousin's 850 compositions. With that very enlightening introduction, together with the MF colleagues, I welcome Dr. Corsa to deliver his keynote address. Welcome, Dr. Corsa. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Very well, thank you. I do apologize for the glitches uh, that uh, uh, delayed us a little bit. It has nothing to do with African time. I am particularly punctual. I use business time, which is actually a lot more precise, but I do um, seek your uh, pardon for the few minutes delay. But uh, here we are um, together again. Thank you very much. At the outset, um, I would like uh, to pay homage to the Mkwanazi family. Uh, Kasi, who is uh, virtually a sister, Kasi Mkwanazi, uh, we lived with them for uh, quite a substantial chunk of time. Sizwe, Tabisa and children, my godson, Nkululeko, Nolita and children, Tobile, uh, my niece, Vusisi Tole, who is founder and head of uh, Nest Life. Vusi, we've lived together for, well, I, got, I don't know how, how, how many years, but I see he has made a success of himself and um, successful people tend to forget where they come from, but not Vusi. This uh, sponsorship uh, bespeaks uh, his uh, connectedness with the community. And we would like to really extend our gratitude to you, Vusi. And I uh, count myself fortunate that our paths uh, crossed and we have had occasion to cooperate. Um, Mr. Andile Nomlala, president of the BMF, the BMF board and uh, chairman Pilani uh, Mapanga, who actually uh, is provincial uh, chairman of the BMF, as well as your colleagues. The BMF um, leadership at large, members of the BMF, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the theme of my lecture or address this evening uh, at the fifth uh, Donald Bongani Mkwanazi Memorial Lecture is what is it all about? Alternatively, what was it all about if you are, if you are about to make your transition to eternity? The theme is inspired by the profound question raised by Professor Eskiam Pashele as he lay on his deathbed. When one of his protégés, Professor Mushen Kondo visited him during the last days of his life, following an exchange of greetings, Eskia paused for a pregnant moment and posed this profound question. What was it all about? The question in my submission is at the core of a purpose-driven life. It is a question that those of us uh, who have been around for decades and are now uh, contemplating transition to eternity should ask themselves, 
What was it all about? It may just spare us to muster enough energy to deliver some good before our final departure. But for you, the current generation of BMF, and other serious-minded youths and young adults of the day, the question must be posed in the present tense. I wonder if we're still together. Hello? Yes, yes we are, Dr. Koza. Oh, no, well, you. you know, Govinda, Govinda disappeared. I thought perhaps uh, you have all disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, yeah, good, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, then uh, uh, resume and continue, and continue. For you, the current generation of uh, BMF members and other serious-minded youths and young adults of today, the question must be put in the present tense. What is it all about? What is the cardinal purpose of your life? What is it likely to be, I mean, what, what is likely to be your legacy? What impact are you having on your family, your community, your corporation, your nation? What positive difference are you or will you be making? If Don Kwanazi were alive, I know that he and I would actually engage in some robust discourse around this question. The well-known humanitarian and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Albert Schweizer, admonishes sagaciously, i.e. wisely, I quote, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones amongst you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. Close quote. Back to Eskiam Pashele. I guess Eskiam Pashele's life as we know it answered the profound question for him the question that he posed, and that uh, he indeed was Eskia the teacher, Eskia the poet, Eskia the writer, Eskia the thinker, Eskia the African humanist and Pan Africanist, Eskia the cultural activist, Eskia the quintessential educator, Eskia the perennial fountain of inspiration. That is surely worthy of a salute by posterity. Before I turn to briefly sharing the life and times of Don Kwanazi, may I put it to you that I consider you to be leaders. Granting that my assumption is right, I exhort you to be at your service leaders, what some conventionally refer to as servant leaders. I implore you to espouse and practice responsive, responsible, accountable, and caring leadership. To be as passionate about your personal goals as you are compassionate in your service of humanity. I challenge you to evidence leadership that is anchored on a sound, wholesome, ethical value system. Leadership that is attuned to your times through its sense of historical mission, res resonating with uh, needs and aspirations of your followership, however we may actually describe that and responsive to a beckoning sense of destiny. I want to believe that uh, as people in leadership, you have a date with destiny. This lecture, in honor of my friend and brother by choice, rather than 
a brother by biological dictates, Donald Bongani Mkwanazi, takes place at a time when the world is in turmoil, struggling to navigate through untold turbulence. This turbulence predates COVID-19 and is compounded by this unprecedented pandemic. The prevailing turbulence is pervasive as national, continental and international. In our beloved country, South Africa, the turbulence is characterized by inter alia, one cannot be exhaustive, but it is characterized by amongst others, a succession of plans that suffocate in, govern in government shelves with no pragmatic timelines, deadlines and durable commitment to implementation. National visions that blur to oblivion before they become rallying forces capable of uniting and aligning the nation. A yawning and menacing debt to GDP ratio that threatens to engulf our political economy and call to question our sovereignty through indebtedness to the IMF. Amongst others, still, galloping unemployment statistics, particularly among the youth, sure to fuel uncontainable instability. Further, monstrous corruption that defies even valiant efforts at dealing with COVID-19, with a COVID-19 pandemic. In my opinion, there is nothing more depraved and inhuman than stealing money meant for the destitute. As for our beloved continent, Africa, the somewhat low intensity, but just as debilitating and potentially devastating signs include the following. The waning of the once powerful, unifying and compelling vision of the African Renaissance and the emergence in its place of limp-wristed African unity leadership that seems to take the continent nowhere. A continent that continues to be in fragments, apparently oblivious of the 21st century version of the scramble for Africa. Thirdly, rampant hunger, malnutrition and starvation on a continent with countries that should be food baskets for the world, not basket cases. It's characterized further by intense and strife in the build up to and post elections, stolen elections, denied elections in the form of indefinite postponements, etc. Further characteristics, atrophy of wholesome practices like the African peer review mechanism. Will one tell me, will anybody tell me where that has gone? And finally, where the continent is concerned, large scale genocide inspired by ideology or religious fanaticism, such as that by Boko Haram and more. Internationally, I'll comment just on the US and the UK, and perhaps in a sentence or two, comment on Russia. Internationally, the turbulence is inter alia manifest in the ascendancy to the presidency of the putative leading world power by an unorthodox, often insensitive, at times not so subtly racist and persistently alien to truth and facts and fundamentally disoriented to reality. In the UK, the emergence of an isolationist 
jingoistic leader to the British uh, Empire who thought, uh, who, who brought upon the British nation the irrational Brexit delusion. The so-called leaders of the free world are obviously oblivious to the reality that the world has become a neighborhood and that what this world sorely needs now is global fraternity or what you might call global brotherhood or sisterhood. With the, immense, with, the, with the imminence of nuclear war about which the US and North Korea feud with gay abandon, the stark choice facing humanity today is between global interdependence or global mutual annihilation. In Eastern Europe, this is characterized by the vice-like grip on Russian citizenry marked by total intolerance of opposition. Amidst all of this turbulence that I could not be exhaustive about, what do you individually and collectively plan to do with your lives to answer the quintessential question, what is it all about? May I now return to briefly reflecting on the life and times of Don Kwanazi, my brother by choice. Don was no saint. I have yet to meet one actually. I'm 70, I'm north of 70 years old. But Don did strive to live an impactful, significant life in a variety of ways. I first met Don at Unilever in Durban during the first half of 1976 as a fellow marketing management trainee. He and I just clicked and resonated instantly. Within months, Unilever witnessed the increase in the number of black management trainees that included amongst others, Sonia Nyasulu, Dennis Zemu, Philip Mangaliso, and others. Unilever, noticing that in fact, we're actually watching them hawkishly, decided to invite us to change canteens to join the white management establishment. They wanted to, uh, to treat us as Amaz MTT. Our principal stance and response was, if indeed you are the pioneering enlightened organization you purport to be, opposed to apartheid as you claim, just demolish the wall separating the races. We refused to be exempted or to be the exempted few. The message reached home and before long, the canteens were desegregated. In 1978, Don and I were part of a successful group of Shell scholar, scholarship candidates sent to Britain. In addition to successfully completing our studies, Don made sure that by the time some of us returned home, we had been duly introduced to the ANC in exile including the inevitable visit to the Tambo home. Upon returning home at the end of 1979, Shell duly employed us in managerial positions in Johannesburg, but could not at the time secure us some abode. No accommodation because we did not have section 101A qualification. The stage was set for a bruising confrontation with apartheid, with, apartheid, with us, you know, the uh, putatively international students who were actually imbued with uh, courage and all oh, bravado. And this uh, confrontation was led amongst others by Don at the forefront. 20 months later, 
We had houses in part of what was then called Selection Park in Pimville. In 1979, Don, Sam Minyoku and I, together with a few of those so-called Shell Scholars, were part of the BMF hard launch. By the way, the BMF had a soft launch in 1977 with Eric Mafuna as founding president. In 1986, Don assumed the presidency of the BMF, which till then was essentially a forum for blacks grappling with the challenge of upward mobility in corporate South Africa. Don brought into sharper focus our appreciation of the reality that the BMF was a player in a political economy, not just in business corporations. Among his uh, major contributions was uh, thrusting to the fore the issue of black economic empowerment. During his tenure, uh, the BMF began in earnest to reach out to other key players beyond the business arena, including then band ANC and PAC, as well as the trade union movement. Don Kwanazi did much to raise the political profile of the BMF. In 1987, Ndonga, Don Kwanazi, led us in a nine-person BMF delegation excursion to Lusaka, where we met with and engaged such ANC stalwarts as Tabombeki, Paolo Jordan, Jacob Zuma, Johnny Makatini, Joel Nashitenje, and Oliver Tambo. To test our mettle, Paolo accused the BMF of attempting the impossible. He accused us of trying to ride two horses simultaneously, the two horses being corporate business and pursuing a career in corporate business and the struggle for liberation, to which we retorted that you can in fact ride more than one horse at once if you are ingenious and creative, what you do if you are in creative, with your creative and ingenious is to inspan the horses, harness them, and make them do your bidding by drawing your cart or wagon with you firmly in control. This led to more serious discourse in which we argued that, in, that in as much as uh, apartheid was politics of oppression and a psychology of dehumanization and subjugation, it was in fact more vicious as economics of exclusion, exploitation, and institutionalized black impoverishment. We argued that to slay the apartheid monster like St. George slew the dragon, we needed to understand it from a variety of vantage points and attack it as such. It was at this engagement that I heard Don Kwanazi argue the need for corporate gorillas. At the end of our discussion, the late O.R. Tambo uh, sprang from his seat as if propelled by a spring to embrace us with enthusiasm. Don Kwanazi, Lord Nlovu and I shared our admiration of Frederick Douglass Afro-American former slave and a deep thinker who advised as who advised as followers 
who advised us as followers on self-determination. He advised as follows, I quote, our destiny is largely in our hands. If we seek, if, if, if we find, we shall have to seek. If we succeed in the race of life, it must be by our own energies and our own exertions. Others may clear the road, but we must go forward or be left behind in the race of life. If we remain poor and dependent, the riches of other people will not avail us. If we are ignorant, the intelligence of other people will do but little for us. If we are foolish, the wisdom of other men will not guide us. If we are wasteful of time and money, the economy of other people will only make our destitution the more disgraceful and hateful. Close quote. These wise words gave both Don and, uh, Don and Lot impetus to champion the cause of black economic empowerment. If Lot and Lovu was the St. Paul of the Black Management Forum course and black economic empowerment, Don Kwanazi was the St. Peter. Bold, daring, dedicated and unwavering, an apologetic drum major for transformation. Of Don, Philip James Bailey would say, we, quote, we live in deeds, not years, because I mean, Don's life was not that long. We live in deeds, not years, in thoughts, not figures on a dial. We should count time by heart throbs. He most lives who thinks most, feels the noblest, and acts the best. Close quote. I want to believe that we conquer. And if we had um, superabundance of words, we'll, pro we'll probably paraphrase that in a manner that befits Don Mkwanazi. I suggest, sorry, back to the quintessential question, what is it all about? Allow me to enunciate a few core values and what I suggest we exhort you to commit to. I exhort you, implore you, or ask you earnestly to pledge to transform the current breakdowns in our society into breakthroughs. We should replace defeatist notions with victorious thoughts. I exhort you to undertake to replace can't do attitudes with a sense of efficacy, consciousness of oppression with consciousness of victory. I exhort you to commit to replacing harassment of our women and children with a superabundance of affection and care, to do away with self-effacement and to replace it with self-effectiveness and assertiveness. I implore you to dispel pervasive incompetence and to champion African accomplishment at par with the best there is globally. I implore you to replace immoral behavior with ethical conduct. From this day on, let us strive to dispel failure and shame 
from our lives and commit ourselves to success and even greater success in all walks of life as South Africans and contemporary leaders. I have uh, personally developed a mantra that I chant to myself regularly. It is a mantra about an ideal African, an African who is master of her own destiny, an African who has a clear and compelling vision, an African who is known for what he stands for, an African who is a profoundly moral being, an African who is imbued with integrity, able and competent, an African who leads a renaissance, an African renaissance, an African who takes responsibility for his or her actions, an African who builds a future, an African who, when he or she looks in the mirror, sees the hand of God. Lord Nilovu conspicuously championed the cause for transformation and comprehensive Black economic empowerment. Donald Bongani Kwanazi unmistakably repositioned the Black Management Forum as a player in South Africa's political economy. Bonang Mohale championed the cause that, took, that, that talked truth to power, particularly on the issue of corruption. What will you or your lingering legacy be as an individual and as a collective, the BMF? Regularly ask yourself, the quintessential question, what is it about? What am I about? What are we about? This generation of BMF leaders, as well as uh, your African peers in other walks of leadership life are charged with the urgent responsibility to redefine South Africa, redefine Africa in all its dimensions in your own image. I thank you. I thank you, sir. Interesting facts indeed. So ladies and gentlemen, ask yourselves, what is your legacy? It's thought-provoking indeed. And as Dr. Kosas rightfully said, be a master of your own destiny. At this point, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge former president, Mr. Mkani. As we prepare to introduce the next speaker who represents the Mkunazi family, let us take a moment to remember the great man that has made this lecture possible. A man that was not only loyal, but courageous and fearless. He was principled to the core on issues he believed in and was ready to die for those issues. His commitment to BE was impeccable. He was a person who stood for BE when it was least, least fashionable to do so. He so aptly encouraged small businesses to create ideas on value chain of each business in order to have a unique and innovative company. He looked beyond the now. Dr. Mkonazi was passionate about entrepreneurship for South Africa's economic growth strategy. He believed that entrepreneurship is a necessary risk that our people must be prepared to take because it creates jobs and therefore reduces the poverty which breeds crime. And this is a message we need to hold on, especially during these critical times 
that the that our country faces. Join me as I wel- welcome Tizwem Konazi, who will share his thoughts on this annual memorial lecture in memory of our hero, Dr. Mkonazi. Tizwem, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, good evening, everyone. A special greeting to Dr. Koza and your family, and thanks for a powerful lecture on your comrade and brother, Donim Kwanazi. Another special and warm greetings to the BMF President, Mr. Andy Lenomlala, Deputy President, Tazniem Fredericks, past presidents of the BMF present this evening, and board members of the BMF present with us this evening, the chairperson of BMF uh, KZN, Mr. Pilani Mapanga, and your and, and your board. I would also like to give a, a warm and a special greeting to Babu Vusus Tole, founder and chief executive of Nest Life. And lastly, I would like to greet my family, the Mkwanazi family, and the friends of the Mkwanazi family that are present with us this evening. After last year's lecture in Durban, uh, we had not heard of COVID-19, and little did we know that the fifth annual lecture will take place virtually and not in Durban. Dr. Koza, we would have liked to host you in Durban this evening, where you and Ubaba met, and uh, entice you and your family to spend the rest of the weekend uh, in Durban. But I would just like to extend an invitation to you to attend the sixth annual Donum Kwanazi lecture in Durban next year. And I don't say that ignorantly, if we have learned something from this lockdown, lecture hopefully will be held in Durban, but those that cannot attend, you can tune in via Zoom or Microsoft uh, Teams. I just want to state, uh, Program Director, and to the President of the BMF, that I am a member of the BMF Midran branch in good standing. Uh, I would also like just to ask for a moment of silence for Dr. Kolani Mkwanazi, who passed away in January this year. Thank you. Ubab Tolani always supported the lecture. He always attended all the lectures since they started in 2016. And uh, he was with us even last year at the lecture in Durban. U Dr. Tolani Mkwanazi was very supportive to his brother, Udon Mkwanazi, and he was very supportive to the rest of the family and us, especially after Undonga passed away in 2016. Babu Ruel, again, thanks for the lecture and thanks for sharing with all of us the work, the contribution, the journey that you shared with Undonga. It started at Unilever, Oliver Brothers, then the Shell Scholarships to the United Kingdom, the founding of the Black Management Forum, and other BMF work from the 70s through to the 90s, and obviously working together at Shell and many other important milestones over the years. My brother, Unkululego, and I were able to attend our father's uh, memorial service on the, 6th of July, on the 6th of July in 2016 at Rayma Church, and you were the main speaker that evening. The passing of our father was still fresh and extremely painful. It had only been four days since he had passed. But we were comforted by the speakers on that evening, but we were especially comforted by your words and, sh- and sharing stories about Undonga, our father. 
as I speak this evening, if I say Undonga or UDDP, you must know that I'm talking about U Dr. Donim Kwanazi. We usually call him uh, DDP uh, and Undonga. As children, not just in my family, as children, sometimes you don't know or you don't recognize the contribution and the sacrifices that our parents make for us and others. And we left that evening knowing of the contribution and the work that Undong had done. Obviously, some of the stories he did not share with us as his children. And obviously, we've got all sorts of friends and people that we know. And you think of your father, someone who just worked in corporate and business, and you don't think he contributed to apartheid and that type of stuff, but you just realize the work that he did. And Babur, well, you, you actually made us realize that uh, all of the stories that you shared. That evening you shared with us that Tundonga made sure that you meet the African National Congress during your time in the UK as postgrad students. And you recently mentioned to me when you were chatting on the phone that Undonga suggested and you guys went to Oliver Tambo's home unannounced in the UK. And needless to say, U Oliver Tambo wasn't there. And as you said, that you guys uh, were actually youngsters. You guys should have maybe made an appointment or phone. Another important milestone in Indonga's tenure as the president of the Black Management Forum in 1986-87, I'm not sure of the dates, you both led a delegation to meet the leadership of the African National Congress that you mentioned earlier in Lusaka and in London. Luckily, because I like uh, reading, I read Frederick Van Zyl Slappet's book uh, about 13, 14 years ago, and I can't find the copy of the book. But Frederick Van Zyl Slappet, because he was part of the, um, the leadership, the Africana guys, uh, he mentioned in the book that you and Undonga were part of the delegation that met the African National Congress. But also, Babruel, you also referred to it in your own book. I've got two copies of your book here. Uh, Attuned Leadership, that was signed by you for me. I'm not sure if everyone can see. Uh, when you were speaking on the 29th of March in 2012. And then there's also another book of yours that Ubaba bought for me, which is about leadership and Ubuntu. And Undong wrote a big thing for me on this book. Unfortunately, you can't actually re read it or see, but I would just like to read the last line that Undong said to me because, uh, yeah, so he wrote all sorts of stuff. It was on the 30th of March, I apologize, on the 30th of October, 2006. Undong said, please enjoy reading about leadership, which is underpinned by Ubuntu. And then if I can just go back to this attuned uh, leadership, because I was speaking about what you spoke about earlier, about you guys going to the UK, on page 166, and I would suggest to everyone with us in the audience, uh, I'm not very good with sales and marketing, but if you go to Dr. Ruel Koza's website, which is uh, www.ruelkoza.co.za, you can, you can buy these books if you haven't read them. But if you can just allow me, program director, just to read on page 166, uh, it will be a few lines. It reads as follows. In 1987, okay, so the subtitle of, or the heading is Itambo. So in 1987, I was a co-leader of the Black Management Forum delegation to meet the ANC at Pamozi Hotel in Lusaka, Zambia. The, the other co-leader was Don Mkwanazi, now a prominent KwaZulu Natal businessman and economic advisor to the government, who was president of the BMF at the time while I was a patron. Don broke the ice, but because I was in some sense the elder among the group that went to Lusaka, I was perforce thrust into the position as spokesperson. I ended up engaging with the likes of Paolo Jordan and Jacob Zuma. Oliver Tambo, president of the African National Congress in exile, made a 
special effort to get to Zambia from London as he had heard about this group of so-called black intellectuals and black business people who wielded some weight inside the country. I'm gonna end it there. So naturally, uh, after I read that and I read Dr. Frederick Van Zyl Slabert's book, I went to ask Baba about that period and his response wasn't very long. He said it was tough, but glad to have Ruel on our side. Undo would go on and say, Uruel is, an ex is extremely intelligent and a hard worker, which is a deadly combination. And I think he didn't say it in those words, it was hint, hint, my son. Few more highlights that Undonga shared with me was a meeting he had with the late Mr. Govin Mbegi shortly after his release from Robin Island in 1989. He mentioned that he was sharp and asked a lot of questions. He asked a lot of tough questions because he wanted to understand the Black Management Forum and its role in South Africa. Lastly, I don't remember very well, but I read somewhere, I think it was one of the Black Management Forum magazines, that in 1991, Undonga was only 38 years old. He was invited to Carlton Center where there was a meeting between corporate South Africa, which was obviously white owned and the Afrikaans people and the leadership of the ANC, which was led by the former president Nelson Mandela. Undonga mentions that Nelson Mandela mentioned the BMF and he requested Undonga to stand up in front of everyone. And Undonga thought, yo, I'm this young 38 year old and I'm actually being recognized for the work that collectively as the BMF they were doing. I think it was before the end of his tenure as the president of the BMF. Who did it be as we affectionately called him? was not only passionate, but he felt very strongly about education, transformation, entrepreneurship, and believed in black people that if you give them an opportunity, they are more than capable to achieve the highest levels of success in any field. Give them an opportunity, be it entrepreneurship, be it in accountancy, be it in science, be it in technology, that's what Undonga believed in. And with this COVID and the lockdown that you're going through and most of us working from home with the use of technology, I hope, Mr. President Andile Nomlala, you are paying attention that as black people and entrepreneurs, we can participate in that surge of demand and growth in the technology space. Just to go back on Undonga, if you didn't want to study further after matric, he had no time for you. He loved, re he loved reading and he encouraged us to read, uh, not just our textbooks at school and at varsity, but books that you've got an interest in and magazines and journals. He also wrote very well and he was an excellent speaker. Maybe there might be bias there because He's my father and I loved him and he's our hero as his kids. He believed in entrepreneurship, but he believed in planning your life. Spend a little bit of time in corporate, get experience, but start your business and do the planning. The reason he loved entrepreneurship, and I know that he's proud of you, Babu Stole, because you're running a black owned company that's competing against companies that have been there for years and years. He believed in entrepreneurship because it creates jobs and you get to play an active role in the economic activity of your country, South Africa, of the continent and globally, and you contribute to gross domestic product growth. Uh, Ubaba uh, got me to read Donald Gordon's book and uh, the Liberty Life Story 1989. Like, this guy's a chartered accountant, he started his business, you know, so, so that's the first book in business that I had a chance to read. And I think I did complete the book. And I think it's probably one of the things that helped me 
actually get a job at Stanley because I mentioned that in my job interview that I read Donald Gordon's book as a 12 year old in 1989. He also encouraged me to read Lee Lacoca's book. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing the last name correctly. Lee Lacoca was an executive at Ford and he transformed the company. I don't think I actually completed that book. So I think my gift of reading I get from Ubaba. Uh, I'd just like to move over to you, uh, Jobe Mondise. Thank you so much, Babus Tole, for your generosity by sponsoring the Don Mkwanazi lecture from the first one in July 2016. We remember, and you shared this with me, that the BMF was meant to have a function in Durban in July, and you and Dundonga were meant to be the main speakers. Uh, unfortunately, Ndonga passed away early July, and then the Don Mkwana's lecture was founded, and Nest Life has been there since the beginning. Thank you for being part of the annual Don Mkwana's lecture from the beginning. Sibonga kakulu for Umusa and Utando Luako. And we just also thank you, Baba, for making even tonight's lecture possible. It's lockdown, it's COVID but you are here with us and thank you for your kind words and remarks earlier this evening. We are proud of Nest Life. <laughs> and the reason I'm smiling is because I work for, for an insurance company and it's blue and I'm not gonna mention the name, but I won't be there forever. So we are proud of Nest Life. It's a black owned company, black managed, black controlled, which was what you know was all about that was formed after 1994. And you guys are more than 20 years old. I remember you celebrated your 20 year anniversary a few years ago. And I've had a privilege to be invited to some of the functions you had over the years. We as the Mkwanazi family and everyone with us this evening, we are wishing you many more years of success and growth. But ladies and gentlemen, Nest Life will only grow if we support them. Without our support, they're not going to grow. So it's a black business that needs to be here 50, 100 years from now, even when all of us are not here. To the Black Management uh, Forum, we are grateful for the annual Donum Kwanazi Lecture and thank you for this platform to honor and share memories of Ndonga's contribution and work. Mr. Nomdala, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, but I think you are the first president of the BMF or the second president of the BMF when you became the president that you were not based in Gauteng. When Obama became president in 86, he was Durban based and stubbornly he wanted to remain in Durban. So he traveled a lot. So I think you were the next one, or if I'm correct, or Professor Wiseman Kush, who may have been the next one. I'm not sure whether he was based in Gauteng at the time, or I think he was based in Cape Town. I remember as kids going to his house on holiday. So I think he was based in Cape Town. So you're one of the few, uh, but you've since decided to make the move and be based in Gauteng. Mr. Nomlala, our president, thank you for your leadership, especially in these challenging and tough times. No lockdown or COVID-19 is stopping you and the BMF. We hear you on radio and see on national television, plus on Zoom meetings. Thanks for the Professor Lumumba lecture last week. And we also see you on Facebook Live. I think you were invited by the ANC Professionals League. And uh, you don't shy away from the current challenges that we are facing lack of transformation in corporate South Africa. And I'm gonna repeat that, lack of transformation in corporate South Africa. And I speak up at racism, I don't speak up at racism, but I mentioned racism. I just wonder what racism was like when Oba Bruel, no Baba were in corporate in the 70s and the 80s. Now Oba was told, I know before you started your own company, you were in corporate because the racism now and Lack of, transform lack of transformation. And we see you, our president on 
expressing your, your views on lack of support for black professionals, especially CEOs in state-owned companies, the inequalities, racism, rampant corruption, and a lack of women empowerment. And unfortunately, we also seeing a surge or it's being reported on, on gender-based violence. I think we should love and respect our women, but gender-based violence is one of those ugly things that we are dealing with. Political freedom is not enough, and we also need economic freedom for our people and future generations. Keep on fighting the good fight. I know that the, um, I know that the BE Commission report came out. I didn't have time to research much, but there's something that was sent by uh, my brother-in-law, I think. Yeah, if that's the right word. My wife's sister's husband. Um, it, it, it reads as follows. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, and I can't see the table very well. 26 years of democracy, the most unequal society in the world as measured by our Gini coefficient of 63. Broad-based black economic empowerment has failed in developing black and female equity with black ownership at 29% overall and only 3% of the JSE. Business is failing to find black talent to promote into management roles despite increasing its skills and enterprise development, I would imagine it reads. So unfortunately, very concerning. Uh, just before I conclude, uh, when lockdown was extended, I had my doubts about the lecture taking place this year, but thank you for your leadership, uh, Andile to you and the BMF uh, for organizing and organizing committee for making tonight possible and a success. I truly grateful. I believe the Black Management Forum is in safe hands. Just coming to my family, I would like to thank my family, especially my, especially my mother, for supporting Obaba in his fight for transformation in business and society. I would have requested my siblings to share a few thoughts on uh, this evening, what they would like to share. Uh, I am speaking on behalf of the family. So I'm gonna start by sharing, yeah. So all my, my siblings as an elder brother, I, I asked them to share some stuff. So let me read it uh, to you. Thank you. BMF and Nest Life, our sponsor for honoring Ubaba with this, with this memorial lecture. We thank you for choosing to host it online to ensure that this wealth of knowledge is imparted to more people. Transformation, empowerment of young people and equipping of leaders continues to be values that Ubaba held close to his heart. May we never tire of pursuing them. Thank you, Dr. Koza. It is an honor to have you as a guest speaker at the fifth annual Don Mkwanazi lecture. Thank you for sharing your experiences with DDB, studying in the UK and corporate days in Unilever, Shell and early days of the BMF. We are truly grateful. Nolita and Kululego Mkwanazi. Next one, this is the first of its kind and we are grateful to the BMF and to Nest Life for continuing what was started in 2016 Thank you for your commitment and willingness in celebrating, honoring, and remembering Ubaba. This evening, I am tuned in watching No Mama Ekaya. And as a family, we are thrilled and feel deeply privileged to have Ubaba Royal Kosa this year, whom Ubaba praised for his brilliance and unapologetic ways. Ubaba spoke at length many times about black economic empowerment for generations to come, but also ethical leadership, which our world continues to beckon for. And so the fight continues. 
Which side are you on? I ask. Long live Ndonga, Kwalimkos, Shamas. Long live Baba. We are never without you. Tobile Mkwanas. Ubaba Undonga Umkulu was the big tree of the nation. A tree represents physical and spiritual nourishment, transformation, and liberation. This epitomized Undonga's role in fight to empower the black scholar. I will leave you with Psalm 78 verse 4. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord about his power and his mighty wonders. Ndonga, your legacy will live on for 14 generations and more to come. We will continue to shape our society for the better of the black empowerment. It is our duty to carry on from the foundation you laid in this country. Thank you, BMF and Babus Tole for honoring Ndonga. Long live the big tree. Luazi Mkwanaz. The great use of life is to spend it for something that will outlast it. William James. I believe that I believe that the Donum Kwanas Memorial Lecture now in the fifth year is proof that my father lived a life that would outlast him and benefit generations to come. This of course being possible with the undivided support of the BMF and his life. I'm eternally grateful for this partnership that up upholds Dr. Tony Mkwana's legacy. I am better for it. Thank you very much. Rest assured, the baiting has been passed. Onobuntu Nana Mkwana's. Thank you for ensuring that Tubaba's legacy has been kept alive through the powerful device of storytelling. It is in the stories that we see the faithfulness and sovereignty of God over generations Dreams are born from the stories and inspiration drawn from them. May we be shaped for the impact from these beautiful lectures. Our I quote, our children may learn about the heroes of the past. Our task is to make ourselves architects of the future. Jomo Kenyatta. That was Tabi Sam Kwanaz. Uh, briefly, I would like to hand over to my daughter, uh, Nikita Mkwanazi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Are you able to hear me? Is my audio fine? Yes, we are. Yes, okay. we are. Thank you. Okay. Um, I believe Dr. R. Koza and my grandfather, Don Mkwanazi, admirers of Frederick Douglass, former slave in the United States of America. I'd just like to emphasize and repeat the quotes that were said by Dr. R. Kosa. Our destiny is largely in our hands. If we find, we shall have to seek. If we succeed in the race of life, it must be by our own energies and by our own exertions. Others may clear the road, but we must go forward or be left behind in the race of life. If we remain poor and dependent, the riches of other men will not avail us. If we are ignorant, the intelligence of other men will do but little for us. If we are foolish, the wisdom of other men will not guide us. If we are wasteful of time and of money, the economy of other men will only make our destitution more disgraceful and hurtful. Over to Zen. When a man raises himself from the lowest condition in society to the highest, mankind pays him the tribute of their admiration. When he accomplishes this elevation by native energy, guided by prudence and wisdom, their admiration is increased. But when his course onward and upward, excellent in itself, furthermore proves possible, what had hitherto been regarded as an impossible reform. Then he becomes a shining light on which the aged may look with gladness, the young with hope, the downtrodden, as a representative of what they themselves may become. James McLean Smith 
on Frederick Douglass. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I think power to the ladies. I, I am not done yet, sorry. <laughs> we just pressed it by mistake. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Program Director. Thank you very much, Nikita, all the way in Cape Town, and thank you to Zenande. I would like to quote from Oliver Reginald uh, Tambo. A corrupt ANC will be far worse than a bad date. The next one. Let's tell the truth to ourselves, even if the truth coincides with what the enemy is saying. Let us tell the truth. I would just like to conclude now. Thank you for the opportunity and the time. Uh, Program Director, thanks uh, very much for a great job uh, this evening. You were really great and you ran the program professionally and very well. Barbara Well, thanks again for delivering a great and thought-provoking thought lecture on your friend, who did it be? Thank you very much, Barbara Well. Again, to the Black Management Forum and Nest Life, thank you very much for making tonight possible and a success in sharing stories and remembering and honoring our father. I don't necessarily like to mention people by name, but I would like to thank the BMF organizing committee, each and every person in that committee that made sure that this lecture takes place uh, for assisting us and communicating with us as, as, as a family. But I would just like to mention two names uh, Felipe, my brother, and Kulugazi as well for your contribution. You worked very hard and it is really appreciated. Uh, before I thank everyone at home, I would just like to just quote two things from the most important book, the Holy Bible. Uh, one is Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then the last one is Philippians chapter 2 verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Everyone at home, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. We thank you very much for loving our Father. And thank you for loving and supporting the Mkwanazi family. Over to you, Vino. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mkwanazi, for those thoughts on this annual memorial lecture. On behalf of the BMF leadership, huge gratitude to each and every single speaker tonight for your time that you've taken to be here and share with us your time, your effort, and your message. I thank you. While we take time to remember our stalwart, Dr. Mkunazi, and the vision and the inroads that he has paved for a better South Africa for all of us. I thank you all. Be safe. Take care during this very unprecedented times. May you have an amazing next couple of months. Um, and now more than ever, let's remember the teachings and what we've learned from Donam Konazi. He believed in the possibility of opportunities for black people. And let's go forth and live that legacy. I thank you and good night.